The following program is the work of the broadcast students at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT Magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland, which were produced over the last week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their instructors. Coming up on BCIT Magazine, protesters clash over what should be taught in schools. Hot activists respond to criticism of their 420 event. And robots are taking over the classroom. Welcome to BCIT Magazine. I'm Aaron Gillen. And I'm Daria Zargar. A new curriculum about gender and sexuality in BC schools had people of all ages protesting earlier this week. My co-anchor Aaron went to the opposing rallies to find out more. Died. <laughs> Hundreds gathered on one side to send a message to the BC Teachers Federation that they don't agree with public schools teaching sexual orientation and gender identity. Many parents took their kids out of schools to show their disagreement with a program, also known as SOGI123. Let's stop wasting kids' time, let's stop wasting education dollars, and let's give the future of tomorrow the best uh, equipment we can, and that's a good education. Our goal is to uh, stop SOGI completely within the schools. But the sea of anti-SOGI supporters were not alone. A counter-protest was right across the road. The Langley woman who organized the reaction says she's remaining positive and peaceful. I hope we can get to the point um, where people that disagree perhaps can say, you know what, I don't agree with you, but I also, I don't want to do any harm. My goal is to never have to do this again, honestly. The pro Soji parents say every child has the right to feel recognized, accepted and safe. Principles they feel Soji123 encourages. Back on the other side, Simpson says they have the wrong idea. SOGI123 isn't about LGBTQ. It's not about not welcoming transgender children into the, the classroom. And so it's a very interesting situation for them to be so upset about something that they have no idea what our position is. Uh, they, they just use bully tactics and call us haters and try to shut down our rallies. The anti-SOGI group says the program is part of a political agenda that uses psychological techniques to sexualize children. They want the program completely gone from schools. Until then, they say they'll continue rallying for as long as it takes to get SOGI out of the schools. Aaron Gillen in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Sunset Beach in Vancouver is at the center of a big debate this week. The City Park Board says participants at a 420 event ruined the field. Our reporter Aya Bonasso caught up with two Vancouver cannabis activists to talk about what this could mean for future events. This is what Sunset Beach Park looks like three days after the Vancouver's annual 420 pot rally. The Vancouver Park Board has decided to fence off the park for rehabilitation from the damage done to the grass from the rally. This situation has caused a lot of tear up between people on social media, with some blaming the 420 organizers. Cannabis advocate Jody Emery claims Park Board Chair Stuart McKinnon exaggerated the damage, and that started, in her words, an online spear campaign. It really hurts to see national headlines saying 420 activists destroyed the park when it's not true factually, and it's also slander towards a very well-run organization with no violence, no fights, and everyone having a good time. On Saturday morning, the park board tweeted that this was a terrible loss of park space. It stated that the park would be closed for 10 weeks for major rehabilitation. The Park Board has since reinspected the field and changed the timeline to six weeks. The Vancouver 420 Event Society says it spent $30,000 on concrete grade turf protecting panels to minimize the damage to the field. Event organizer Dana Larson says the damage would have been no different than if it was from any other event. He feels that they are being targeted because of pot stigma. So when they say, oh, it's about Sunset Beach and particular issues here, that's just not true. They just don't want cannabis users using public parks. Ultimately, that's the real issue. This is what park goers said about the closure. 
in terms of like last year to this year is very much an improvement for sure. Yeah. If you're looking at it like that, last year was just mud, mud and you couldn't even see green grass. Right now from a distance, it looks like it's not that bad. And it's just gonna take some nice sunny days for it to, you know, to fix itself. I don't really see anything that terribly wrong with the lawn. The park board will continue to push organizers to find an alternate location for the event in future years. Aya Benasso in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Our reporter Aya Benasso joins us now with more on the story. Now Aya, what has to be done to rehabilitate the field? Well, the park board did release a statement about the closure saying the field still needs receding, aeration and topsoil. Now, a forecast of warm and dry weather will help. Aaron? Now, is there anywhere else the event can take place besides Sunset Park? The organizers did express they have been trying to gain permits for other locations, such as the Peony Fairgrounds, which would be better suited for the crowd size and off of fields. Back to you. Thanks, Aya. The city of Vancouver has officially apologized for historic discrimination against the Chinese community. As Carol Zhu reports, one Vancouver councillor says this apology is long overdue. In the past, Chinese Canadian in Vancouver were only allowed to be in specific properties primarily in Chinatown. Standing in the Vancouver City Council was unheard of. It would be highly unlikely that they would be allowed even into the building. At the time, I think that there was such fear of Chinese, jealousy and animosity towards Chinese. In 2014, Louis proposed a motion in City Council to apologize to the Chinese community for historic discrimination. Louis' grandfather moved to Canada in the 1920s. The family was reunited in 1955. My grandfather passed away in 1959. You know, my father only had a few years with uh, his father here in Canada. Third-generation Chinese-Canadian Zheng Ying's father left China before he was born. When Zheng finally met his father again, he was already a teenager. I have never seen my father until I came over to Vancouver. Well, that was like a decade. It was a strange place. It was not as friendly as what we see it here today. A lot of times we, we have people calling us names. In 1923, the Chinese Immigration Act excluded Chinese from coming to Canada. This historic injustice splintered many Chinese families. The city of Vancouver finally announced an official apology to the Chinese community on May 22nd. But why did it take so long? It did take uh, quite a bit of time for staff to undertake the research necessary to understand exactly the component pieces of what the city of Vancouver specifically had undertaken. Louis says the response from the public has been positive. I, th I think a lot of people uh, say that is. Uh, uh, way overdue, but you know, it's a good thing that it happened, so we're very pleased that it happened. No Chinese person was employed by the city of Vancouver until 1952. Today, Chinese Canadians are an integral part of the society. This was uh, something that I think was unimaginable to them and really highlights for me what an honour it is for myself to be here today, to be a representative for the Chinese community. I'm Carol Xu for BCIT Magazine. Coming up after the break, a potential new UNESCO site in Vancouver. And two engineering students are fighting gender bias. Back order control. Move out just a tiny bit. Sorry, say that again? Can you zoom out a tiny bit? It's, it's a quick two years. They get you in and they get you out, but you leave with so much more knowledge when you walk in. The BC Hockey League hosted the third annual BCHL Showcase last weekend. The showcase also allows fans to come to uh, The tools you learn are very valuable. Uh, you leave with a concrete knowledge of many of the programs that are used in everyday workforces around all the newsrooms in Vancouver. At the beginning of your two-year program, you don't really expect that in two years' time you're walking out ready to be a part of the journalism industry. Good morning and welcome to Evolution News. I'm Chantal Kostica. I was lucky enough to get a job a week after I graduated. I think that has a lot to do with uh, the teachers and fellow students prepping you for the outside life once you graduate from BCIT. Yeah, if it wasn't for BCIT, I'd be lost. Welcome back. 
Vancouver is searching for ways to preserve Chinatown, including having a designated UNESCO World Heritage Site. However, as Natalia Cuevas reports, some locals are concerned with what that will mean for longtime residents. Managing developments in Chinatown is just one step in preparing the area to become a UNESCO World Heritage Site. However, residents are concerned that designating Chinatown as a UNESCO site will lead to a huge influx of tourists. It's happened in many other Chinatowns in North America where, you know, you get a lot of symbols of red or pandas, but it becomes an empty, vapid place for tourism but without considering what that means for residents who live here. Many locals are unsettled by the proposed move to a heritage site and feel it will make the neighborhood almost unlivable. I feel that it's going to be very difficult for us to see um, any kind of rejuvenation of what this used to be. Like, it's sad to say, but I've always been sad that my children won't be seeing the same Chinatown that I did, or I was sad that I never got to see the Chinatown that my parents did or even like that because, you know, over the years, like, it's just, the presence has just slowly diminished. It. The World Heritage designation may not take place for another five to eight years. Meantime, locals will continue to enjoy what's left of the area's traditional shops and historical character. Natalia Cuevas in Vancouver, Chinatown for BCIT Magazine. Our reporter Natalia Cuevas joins us now to provide more details. Natalia, how will the UNESCO Heritage Site designation impact historic areas like Sun Yat Sun Garden? Some residents are concerned because the garden could become overpopulated and extremely loud, and seniors who once went there to enjoy a peaceful landscape will no longer have that. Daria? Will the UNESCO designation affect shop owners who have been operating in Chinatown for a long time? Well, it's hard to say whether the UNESCO name will badly affect businesses. All I can say is that some members of the community believe it could help traditional stores that are struggling. Back to you. Thanks, Natalia. Local coffee roasters and Indonesian farmers recently held a forum to discuss coffee, culture, and climate change. Our reporter Ash Murney attended to see what was brewing. This is just a typical day for this engineering student, one of just two women working in a mechanical engineering lab. You can see in school, there is a small population of women in the engineering field, uh, be it civil, be it mechanical, there's still quite a small population of them. And in order to increase the amount of students in, this, in these fields, um, it's important to uh, bring this problem to light and, um, and send a message out to the community, so community outreach to high schools and even to elementary schools. BCIT's Women in Engineering hopes to put a dent on the gender issue by holding social networking events and encouraging more women to compete at engineering competitions. Anyone I talk to who doesn't actually know a lot about engineering, they tell me, why are you in engineering? You're not a guy. I mean, you need, you need, to, be, you need to have strength to do things. And it's not only about that. Like you can actually see the different variations of magnitude. The club members from different engineering disciplines also share their knowledge to make sure women have more chances to succeed in the industry. If they ever feel like they want to quit because they're the only female in their program, they won't because there will be someone there to support them. Jason Manawis in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. Local coffee roasters and Indonesian farmers recently held a forum to discuss coffee, culture, and climate change. Our reporter Ash Murney attended to see what was brewing. Do most Vancouverites know where their beans come from? Coffee is a big part of Vancouver's culture and it is the second most consumed beverage after water. 400 grams of water in here. A lot of these beans come from the Indonesian island of Sumatra. A group of farmers from that island were flown in to discuss the challenges they faced to get their beans to our coffee cups. The crisis, 40 and 60 percent of our productions, that is great, great challenges. That's why now our coffee uh, price is going up because uh, a lot of uh, uh, customers need to buy our coffee, but the stock of coffee is limited. The local roasters were able to meet face-to-face -face with the people who supply their beans and to make sure the source is not being exploited. I think it's important for Canadians to understand where their coffee comes from, uh, especially in today's world. 
where uh, the focus is on being uh, socially responsible, uh, knowing uh, that there's no, we're not contributing to uh, uh, slavery or child labor. The three farm co-ops that the Indonesian farmers came from all worked for a noble cause, whether it was gender equality or sustainability of farmlands. Traceability co-op with concern on the uh, regional farm. Farmers and Roses held a panel where the farmers discussed challenges they face from palm oil companies eating up their lands, and then there's always climate change. The climate change become a problem for the farmers because the climate change can reduce the production capacity. One local roaster plans to donate 5% of their earnings to help the farmers grind it out against these problems. Ash Murney in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Vancouver's Walter Moberly Elementary School is changing the way students learn by dropping the pen and paper and picking up coding skills. Our reporter Jenny Cameron spent the day with a couple of students and robots. On three, one, two, three, go! These robots are being controlled by grade five students. They are using a block-based coding system to control each robot. Coding is part of a new course called Applied Design, Skills and Technology, which is in the new BC curriculum. Billy is one of the many students who enjoys coding. The complexity in there is just very amazing. Practice makes perfect. So how can we interact with the two of them? Scott Burrell works with students to guide them and challenge their critical thinking skills. He says coding is all about problem solving, which is a big part of the new curriculum. Really being experts that can teach other students, which is you learn even more if you teach it. It's all part of sort of the core competencies, which is like critical thinking, communication, creative thinking, personal social awareness. So they're really learning who they are, what they're interested in, and the students are really the ones driving the new curriculum. Burrell says it's more skilled based than content based and encourages teamwork and leadership. Because I get to play with technology for once. Robots are my thing. Although teachers and students are excited about the robots, Burrell says there have been challenges. The one thing we need for the spheros is a lot of space, so it's been hard to find rooms big enough to have 25 kids using 12 yeah. robots at a time. Another challenge is being able to fund the new technology. Teachers agreed to spend $4,000 on the robots this year, but Burrell doesn't know where the money will come from in the future. This thankfully was from our tech budget from this year, but going forward, who knows how much more investment we'll be able to have in technology. I think we need to. Although there are not enough robots for everyone, Burrell says they have been able to use the robots as a tool for their future. Students are teaching the teachers. It's been wonderful to give them a chance to learn in a new way. Very hands-on. I like that. Burrell says coding has kept students engaged longer than a textbook. Jenny Cameron in Vancouver, BCIT Magazine. After the break, we catch up with some radical mountain bikers. And an older generation of athletes are making a racket in Vancouver. Standby graphics, ready camera one. If you want to experience the fast-paced world of news. Today on BCIT Magazine. Striking. Make magic on a movie set. Frame. And action. Or bring your creative ideas to life. BCIT's hands-on training will get you started. BCIT Television and Video Production. Your possibilities start here. I chose BCIT because I know that all the programs are very hands-on. We have our own radio station, like it's, it's one of the best programs that I've ever heard of. I am starting a job on Monday, so confidence is high. Uh, honestly, I didn't think it was going to be this fun. It's going to be May. Ooh, yeah. You might have heard, and it ain't no lie. The April has come and gone. What are you gonna do? 
Laura's got some things for you. So on your musical calendar this week, we've got something for everyone. The SFU Woodward Singers are hosting a workshop on May 3rd, and it's free, drop-in, and in all genres. All are welcome. So community members are also encouraged to simply come in and drink tea and listen. May 5th and 6th brings Shania Twain to Rogers Arena in support of her new album, Now. And this is her first tour since 2015's Rock This Country. Also on May 6th, the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra Academy presents Carnival of the Animals at the Orpheum. Starting at 2 p.m., it's a great introduction to classical music for the whole family, and you'll be supporting the students of the Academy. It's gonna... <sighs> it's gonna be May. It sounds like it's gonna be a great first week of May. Flip whips, truck drivers, and no cans. These are all terms you could hear while at the indoor bike park in Maple Ridge. Landon Magali went there to find out how the park is helping mountain bikers ride year-round. Although it is a nice day today, that hasn't been the case for many months. Liam Wallace is setting up his bike to go ride the Air Rec Center, an indoor mountain bike park. Wallace, a 20-year-old who is trying to make a professional career out of riding his bikes, knows the power this place can have on his career. This uh, helps me a lot with trying to achieve my goal of becoming a professional mountain biker just because I don't have an off-season now. I can ride all year long and as soon as it's not sunny or warm out, I can come inside and I can hit everything that I would hit outside indoors. I can hit skate parks, dirt jumps, trick jumps, everything. The park, which opened just last year, has all the tools to take a rider's ability up to any level they would like, with features ranging from beginner to pro. And yeah, we're Western Canada's largest indoor bike park. And yeah, a little bit more about the Air Center. So about 30,000 square feet. Got half the dirt, half the facilities dirt jumps. So as you see behind me, kind of rhythm sections, kind of flowy, only out of a dirt material for the bikes. And the other half of the park is like a wood box jump section kind of as thing. So it kind of mimics like a skate park, but it's for bikes. And then we have some training kind of aspects in the park as well, like our airbag. And now what that is, it's kind of, um, it's a big bladder of, uh, of air and you jump into it, kind of like a big bouncy castle, but you know, you can jump into it with your bikes and other, you know, your scooters and your skateboards and stuff. And it's super fun to learn tricks. This sport is really hard to get into it for a North American, especially because a lot of the Freeride Mountain Bike Association events are all in Europe. It's a really hard struggle to get into uh, mountain biking. Wallace will be heading out to France to begin his contest season next month. Lana Magali in Maple Ridge for BCIT Magazine. BC Transplant and the BC Kidney Fund join forces this week to boost the number of registered organ donors in the province. Our reporter Michael Beck met with a double lung transplant recipient at the event. Margaret Benson is an inspirational Zumba instructor that teaches as a double lung transplant recipient. After being diagnosed with cystic fibrosis at just the age of 14, she was told she wouldn't make it to her 15th birthday. Margaret defied the odds. After surviving to see her 40th birthday, she was told she needed a double lung transplant. Since she received her lungs, Margaret has championed organ donation while becoming a very active world-class athlete that competed in the World Transplant Games. Margaret wants to live every day in her donor's honor. I think for me, oh, and I'm gonna cry, for me the most emotional part was knowing that someone had to lose their life for me to get mine. I, I just didn't think that was fair. Organ donation has spiked across Canada after news broke that Humboldt Bronco player Logan Boulay was also an organ donor himself. BC Transplant says the number of registered organ donors shot up after the accident. Our spikes were very significant. We had about 4,700 British Columbians in this province register over that week. And normally we would see maybe 20 to 50 a day. More than 20 transplant recipients took part in Zumba classes. Many, like Margaret, say they want to honor their donors by being active and living their lives to the fullest. Michael Beck in Vancouver, BCIT Magazine. What a touching story. Skilled athletes from around the world are funneling into Vancouver for the 2018 Masters Badminton Championship. But as Sean Holden discovered, some of these competitors are not your typical athletes.
Most 80-year-olds carry a purse, but not Wendy Jerome. I want to win this match against my partner. <laughs> Jerome isn't the only one taking a shot at the 70th annual Masters Badminton Championship. And this year is the biggest it's ever been with 366 players. The seniors here say badminton is an opportunity to stay fit and sharp and keep ailments like Alzheimer's disease and dementia at bay. It keeps you physically active, but it also mentally active because it's a thinking game. So it's very good for your, for your body and uh, keeps you active and healthy. So we consider it a lifelong sport. But when the rackets come out, it's game on no matter what the age. I want to make sure that I don't embarrass myself mainly. Then I think uh, that I want to win, obviously. And if I don't win, that's the way it goes. Been through a lot. I've had uh, 16 surgeries, but I've always come back to badminton. And back to Wendy, things aren't looking too good. We lost. It's more about getting out, staying fit, having fun, re you know, renewing acquaintances. Gets you a chance to get together with people you haven't seen for a while. Like I've got a, 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 lo a lovely lady I know from Peru. Okay, the only time I see her is at these competitions. The game is just the half of it. The other is connecting with old friends, building bonds, and finding a place to feel at home. Sean Holden for VCIT Magazine. In the NHL playoffs, the Toronto Maple Leafs have been eliminated by the Boston Bruins in Game 7, leaving the Winnipeg Jets as the last Canadian chance to win the game. The last time Canadian team won the Cup was in Montreal in 1993. Well, it's official. Vancouver has been named BC's rattiest city. Pest control company Orkin has released its list of the top 20 BC cities with the most mouse and rat calls. This is the second time in a row that Vancouver has won this prestigious award. If you have any questions regarding the show, you can contact us at bcit-broadcast.com or bcitbroadcastnews.ca. That's our show for today. I'm Aaron Gillen. And I'm Daria Zargar. Thank you for watching this week's BCIT Magazine. We leave you now with some beautiful scenery from around Metro Vancouver. <laughs>